Hello. Today we're going to pick up from where we left off uh, in our discussion of different types of receptors and signaling pathways. And we're going to spend today's class talking about G-coupled protein receptors. So we will start with this first slide um, summarizing the sequence for G-protein coupled receptors. And in this example, Excuse me, a signal binds to a cell surface receptor linked to an infector enzyme by a G protein, thus getting the name G protein coupled receptors. This is an incredibly important uh, uh, aspect of human receptor biology. G protein coupled receptors and G proteins, their associated G proteins, are present in virtually every cell in humans. We estimate that approximately 40% of drugs used clinically target G protein coupled receptors. So obviously for this particular course, it's an important topic. The sequence of events involves the signal, <clears throat> either a natural agonist or an antagonist, binding to the cell surface of the receptor, linking to an effector enzyme by a G protein. They work by increasing the concentration uh, intracellularly of second messengers, such as cyclic AMP, calcium, or phosphoinositides, a whole series of, of different phosphoinositides. So let's look at a picture. <clears throat> there are many ways in which we could depict a G protein coupled receptor, GPCR for short. In this particular example, the background is supposed to represent a, uh, a cell membrane, a plasma membrane, with its traditional lipid bilayer. So the, the pink circles are, are the lipid components, so the phospholipids across the, the cell membrane. And what you can see in this picture is that the receptor spans the uh, surface of the, of the cell membrane. And we refer to G protein coupled receptors as having seven transmembrane spanning domains. So if you wanted, you could count these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, it's this kind of loopy phenomenon where the receptor crosses forward and back across the membrane. In terms of receptor activity, there is there are two important components of, of this entire structure. One is the extracellular domain and the other is the cytoplasmic domain, very similar to what we've talked about for all the other four different uh, receptor subtypes. So here you can see the extracellular domain and this I should probably do in blue, it might show a little bit better. So the extracellular domain here and then um, the intracellular piece here which is coupled to a G protein. So G protein coupled um, receptor. So let's just talk a little bit about the G protein itself. So another word that is common, or another term that is commonly used in association with describing the structure of G protein coupled receptor is that the G protein itself <clears throat> is a heterotrimeric protein. So what does that mean? Well, it basically means that it is composed of several different subunits, an alpha, a beta, and a gamma subunit. And these are um, in a naturally occurring configuration when the receptor is in its inactivated form. So the three subunits are associated together. The subunits themselves are regulated by factors that influence the, um, the dynamic between GTP and GDP and energy exchange or uh, hydrolysis of GTP itself. G proteins activate or inhibit inf effectors in response to agonists. So they can turn on or turn off a second messenger pathway resulting in a pharmacodynamic effect. So the mechanism of action of a G protein coupled receptor is described as follows. An extracellular ligand, typically an agonist, binds to the cell surface receptor, that extracellular domain of the receptor structure. The receptor, binding to the receptor, it triggers activation of the G protein located on the cytoplasmic face of the cell membrane as I've just previously shown you. This activation of the G protein actually involves dissociation of the subunits. So typically you get dissociation of the gamma subunit from the alpha and the beta subunit. 
the activated G protein changes the activity of the effector element, which is usually an enzyme or even an ion channel. And the example of enzymes or adenylcyclase, phospholipase C, PLC, or phosphokinase C, just being some examples of enzymes whose activity is altered when a G protein is activated. Alternatively, activation of the G protein may be coupled to the activity of an ion channel. Now, that makes things just a little bit more complicated, where you see ion, ion channel receptor activity being linked to G protein coupled receptor activity. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples to try and exemplify that interrelationship uh, from human biology. So following activation of um, the G protein and altering the activity of the effector element, the enzyme or the ion channel, this causes a change in the concentration of an uh, intracellular second messenger, such as an increase in intracellular calcium, an increase in cyclic AMP, uh, et cetera. So let's try and tie all that together just for G protein coupled receptors. So these green circles here refer to the array of different ligands that combine to G-coupled protein receptors in human biology. So over on the first beside the arrow that I've just drawn um, are a series of different proteins. In this example, thyroxin hormone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. These two hormones are involved in female reproductive activity. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone involved in most metabolic processes. In addition to this are a series of other small molecules, small proteins that can activate G-coupled proteins. These G-coupled protein receptors, these are all naturally occurring ligands. And then we have even smaller molecules, amino acids, amines, nucleotides, nucleosides, prostaglandins, etc., all of which can activate the receptor. Chemical stimulants, odorants, ions such as calcium, all naturally occurring uh, ligands or agonists that G protein coupled receptors. And of course, we could insert another arrow here, which would be um, synthesized molecules to either um, simulate or replicate the naturally occurring endogenous molecule or a completely synthetic molecule known to have activity at a particular receptor. Following agonist binding, you get uh, activation of the G protein with dissociation of the, um, sorry, I should have written, done that a different way. Let me just clear that drawing there, which causes dissociation of the alpha and beta subunit from the gamma subunit, and it is then the activity of this activated subunit that uh, alters the activity of an effector. And as we said previously, that effector may be adenylcyclase, that effector may be the activity of an ion channel, and as a result of activity, of altering uh, the activity of these effectors, you get an increase or a decrease in intracellular uh, second messenger signaling to ultimately bring about a pharmacodynamic effect. So that is a pictorial description of uh, the sequence of events from the point of binding of the agonist through to bringing about the pharmacodynamic effect. And this concept is something that is very important that you know about. And I'm going to show you s uh, several examples uh, to try and um, solidify your appreciation of, of this series of steps. So in order to do that, let's look at several different G proteins. And this is not a comprehensive list, but for understanding purposes, I've selected three of the most common uh, G proteins that mediate the effects of G protein coupled receptors. So these are GS, GI, and GQ. GS is linked to an effector, adenylcyclase, and this causes a uh, second messenger response, which results in an increase in cyclic AMP. This is typically a stimulatory response. GI is coupled to the effector adenylcyclase as well, but in this particular, um, in this particular example, the second messenger response results in inhibition. GS, stimulation, GI, inhibition. Another example is GQ, 
In the example of GQ, the effector is phospholipase C, the beta isoform. Altering the activity of phospholipase C causes an increase or a decrease in intracellular calcium. And intracellular calcium in this situation is the second messenger response involved. So these are the three examples that we are going to use as the platform to further explain this aspect of receptor biology. So this example is a, a GS subunit coupled to adenocyclase, which as I showed you in the previous slide, was stimulatory. An example from human biology involves the neurotransmitter epinephrine, also called adrenaline. In this example, epinephrine, a natural ligand, or it could be a, um, administered as a drug in, in um, the clinical management of, uh, of patients. So here in this example, epinephrine is binding to the extracellular domain of the G-protein coupled receptor. And the example of the receptor in this case is the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. And we're going to talk about subtypes in a second. So beta-1 adrenergic receptor, the natural ligand is epinephrine. It binds to the receptor as shown here. This causes dissociation of the subunits. You get the alpha subunit being dissociated from the beta and the gamma subunit. The effector in this particular case is adenylcyclase. An increase in the effector, adenylcyclase, causes an increase in conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is the second messenger cascade involved in the activation of the beta-1 adrenergic receptor in response to epinephrine. Let's translate this into a clinical example. And the clinical example I am going to give you is bronchiolar smooth muscle cells. Where are these found? Not too surprisingly, in the bronchus, in lung tissue. Activity of bronchiolar smooth muscle cells can either result in contraction or dilation. Contraction, commonly referred to as bronchoconstriction, will reduce airway flow. We see this occurring in patients who have asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Bronchodilation of bronchiolar smooth muscle can cause an increase in airway flow. You could imagine that in patients who have asthma, you might want to give a drug that will reverse the bronchoconstriction, induce bronchodilation, and try and improve the amount of airway flow, try and improve the symptoms of shortness of breath, try and improve the delivery of oxygen into the systemic circulation. In this particular example, I am showing you the actions of epinephrine through the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. So in this example, our ligand, epinephrine, and this could be naturally occurring epinephrine, or it could be the delivery of epinephrine to a patient who has complete bronchoconstriction, isn't able to breathe, and we're trying to reverse the activity and induce bronchodilation. So epinephrine binds to its receptor, a G-protein coupled receptor referred to as the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Upon binding of epinephrine to the adrenergic receptor, you get activation of its G-protein, GS. As we've said previously, GS's effector is adenylcyclase. You see an increase in adenylcyclase resulting in the second messenger cascade and increase in cyclic AMP. This increase in cyclic AMP brings about the pharmacodynamic response, which is bronchodilation, thus trying to improve the clinical status of the patient. What about GI? Remembering again, the effector coupled to the GI protein is adenylcyclase also. In this situation, it's an inhibitory response. The example that I'm showing you here is um, 
acetylcholine, the natural ligand, binding to the muscarinic receptor. This is one of the receptors that mediates the activity of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which is central to the parasympathetic nervous system. In this particular example, again, you get dissociation of the beta and the gamma unit, um, leaving the alpha um, subunit of the G protein to instigate the effector, adenylcyclase, giving, bringing about an inhibitory response. A third example is acetylcholine on the sinoatrial node within the heart. So if we, we think about acetylcholine, so let me go back here for one, one second. This is the um, sequences of second messenger activation with the GI subunit of the G protein coupled receptor. This is our clinical example. So where are the um, muscarinic receptors found? Well, in the sinoatrial node in the heart, there is a high concentration of this subtype of receptor. These receptors in the heart contribute to the regulation of heart rate. Acetylcholine coexists with um, adrenaline and noradrenal, noradrenaline in regulating heart rate. So here, acetylcholine binding to the muscarinic receptor is linked to um, a calcium, is linked to an ion channel which regulates the transport of potassium. So in this particular example, the dissociation of the alpha and the, uh, from the beta and the gamma subunits alters the transport of potassium from the intracellular domain to the extracellular domain, resulting in hyperpolarization. This reduces the ability of the sinoatrial node to activate, with the net effect being a reduction in heart rate. And you could imagine then, if we came along with a drug that antagonizes the binding of acetylcholine to the muscarinic receptor, we could diminish the impact of acetylcholine on this ion channel and thereby reduce the natural impact of acetylcholine in slowing down the heart rate. And an example of such a drug would be atropine. And then finally, GQ. So a GQ is linked to the effector phospholipase C. The really only difference here is that the second messenger signaling uh, cascade involves an increase in intracellular calcium. This is a stimulatory pathway with the ultimate uh, impact being quite similar to GS. A clinical example of uh, GQ activation can also be derived from the same tissue type that I used for the GS example, bronchiolar smooth muscle. But in this example, instead of it being a beta-2 adrenergic receptor and epinephrine as the ligand, we are showing you an example of histamine. Histamine is a naturally occurring autocoid, which is generated by a, a vast array of different cells in the body, but most preponderantly by the mast cell. It binds to a histaminergic receptor, in this example showing the H1 subtype. Binding of histamine to its uh, G protein coupled receptor, is, which, which is linked to GQ, results in an activation of its effector, which is PLC, phospholipase C, in the beta isoform. This results in an increase in intracellular calcium, bringing about um, bronchoconstriction. So this, in reality, is what makes life interesting. I've shown you two examples, and let's look at those side by side with each other. The first example I showed you was epinephrine down here binding to the beta-2 receptor. The latter example I showed you was histamine binding to the H1 receptor. These receptors coexist on bronchiolar smooth muscle. However, Activation of these two receptors bring about contrasting action. So the H1 receptor, as we just described, is coupled to GQ. It results in an increase in PLC, an increase in intracellular calcium, and bronchoconstriction. 
epinephrine binding to the beta-2 adrenergic receptor activates, uh, or activates its uh, G protein, which is GS. This results in an increase in the effector adenylcyclase, an ultimate increase in second messenger signaling pathway involving cyclic AMP and bronchodilation. And what makes life so fascinating and interesting to a pharmacologist is this natural homeostasis. Two completely different naturally occurring ligands operating through two completely distinct G-coupled protein receptors, which are coupled to two different G proteins linked to two different effectors and two different second messenger systems, bringing about diametrically opposed responses, with the ultimate intention being homeostasis, that there is an equal balance between bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation that allows the adequate um, um, flow of air and delivery of oxygen to the systemic circulation as is necessary for healthy living. Another example is human platelets. Now, I appreciate that your background knowledge is going to be very variable for all the folks who are listening to this particular presentation, so let me just digress ever so slightly. Human platelets are a type of blood cell. They regulate um, how blood clots or the formation of clots. The activity of platelets is regulated in part by two prostaglandins, thromboxane A2, abbreviated TXA2 for sure, short, and prostacyclin, abbreviated PGI2 for short. Receptors for these two prostaglandins exist on human platelets. For TXA2, it's the thromboxane receptor, uh, designated TP. And for PGI2, it's the prostacyclin receptor, designated PGI. The TXA2, or the thromboxane receptor, is coupled to GQ. And much like the, the previous example for histamine, increases PLC, an increase in intracellular calcium, resulting in platelet aggregation, clumping of platelets together, increasing the likelihood of clot formation. Prostacyclin, on the other hand, is linked to GS. And I think you're probably getting the hang of this now. Think ahead of me. What is the effector? Yes, you are correct. It's adenylcyclase. What does the dental cyclase result in? An activation of a second messenger pathway, which invokes, you are correct, cyclic AMP, and the activation, the natural pharmacodynamic effect as a result of this activation is relaxation or inhibition of platelet aggregation. So here again, you have competing uh, forces at play, thromboxane promoting aggregation, prostacyclin inhibition of platelet aggregation, and ultimately, these exist in a homeostatic phenomenon. Many of you may be aware of the effect of aspirin on uh, clot formation. I mean, many of you know of Bayer's aspirin used to try and prevent heart attack or stroke. What this drug has been intended to do is to inhibit the effect of thromboxane on platelets. In other words, to reduce the aggregatory response in response to thromboxane's activation of the TP receptor to try and create an imbalance, an intentional imbalance between platelet aggregation and relaxation or, plate, or inhibition of platelet aggregation. So this is a concept where our understanding of the G-protein coupled receptor cascade, the natural ligand thromboxane, allows us therapeutic leverage to manipulate this homeostatic balance in favor of one versus the other. And I'm going to show you several examples of where our appreciation of G-protein coupled receptors allows or presents this therapeutic opportunity and creates the therapeutic leverage where whereby we can use drugs to upset the apple cart, so to speak, of this normal homeostatic balance that may exist between different ligands, different receptors, same or different tissues. So this is incredibly complex, and what this slide is attempting to show you is, is that you have um, an array of different agonists. 
are naturally occurring ligands or drugs. All of these molecules can actually uh, be delivered as drugs. They all bind to their own receptors, and very commonly, they can bind to multiple different receptors, or you can have multiple ligands binding to the same receptor, and that's what these arrows are attempting to show, where you see crisscrossing of arrows going everywhere. And ultimately, the activation of these subunits shown here results in downstream pharmacodynamic effects, which are shown in the blue bars and, and or the blue squares and the green squares. So the take-home message from a slide like this is, it's never as simple as one agonist binding to a receptor bringing about a response. It's this interplay between multiple different agonists connected, or multiple different agonists binding to G-coupled proteins connected to different subunits, bringing about different responses in different tissues or even the same tissue, such that there is always the potential for overlapping effect. Now, this makes things complicated, but it also provides us with opportunity. As long as we have an appreciation for where the drugs actually have their impact, we can be somewhat predictive in how we develop the drugs and anticipate their pharmacodynamic effects, both good and bad. So now I'm going to shift the, the, the conversation a little bit to talk about subtypes. I've mentioned the H1 receptor subtype, the beta-1 beta adrenergic receptor subtype, the thromboxane A2 receptor subtype, and the prostacyclin or PGI2 receptor subtype. Subtypes are incredibly important to appreciate. The existence of subtypes represents another example of therapeutic leverage. A single agonist can often be recognized by a group, excuse me, of G-protein coupled receptors. These are almost always similar in sequence, but not identical and they are referred to as subtypes. And while a subtype of a receptor will recognize a common physiologic agonist, subtle differences in the structure of the receptor and sometimes large differences in anatomic distribution provides unique pharmacologic points of attack. And this is an incredibly important concept. So let's look just for a moment at an array of naturally occurring ligands, all of which bind to G-protein coupled receptors. And try and gain an appreciation of the array of different subtypes that that receptor may exist in. So let's look here for an example. We've given you a couple of examples of beta receptors. So beta receptors are G-coupled protein receptors. They mediate the response to adrenaline and noradrenaline, as I said previously, also called epinephrine and norepinephrine. There are three subtypes of these receptors that have relevance to human pharmacology. The beta-1 receptor subtype, very important in cardiovascular physiology. The beta-2 receptor subtype, very important in both cardiovascular and pulmonary physiology. And the beta-3 receptor, which we're beginning to develop our understanding of, is important in terms of adipose metabolism. The dopaminergic receptors, here we're showing you five different subtypes, all of which have different distributions, different concentrations, and the opportunity for the development of drugs that may only activate the D1, the D2, the D3, the D4, or the D5 receptor. We know that the subtypes have differing degrees of importance in different aspects of physiology. For example, the D2 receptor subtype is very important in emesis or vomiting. It's very important in GI motility. It's very important in the control of movement and in movement disorders such as schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease. Histamine, an example that I've shown you previously, three different subtypes of histamine receptors, H1, H2, and H3. H1, we know, is very important in mediating the allergic response. H2 receptors are very important in terms of gastric acid production in the GI tract.
and I could go on. Each of these different naturally occurring ligands can bind to each of these subtypes of receptors. But it's the nature of the subtype of the receptor and the affiliated effector and second messenger signaling pathways and the distribution of these receptors and areas of high concentration of the receptors that will ultimately predicate the response to any given agonist. And what I'm going to try and do in the next series of slides is show you examples of this from real clinical medicine in order to facilitate your understanding of the complexity of receptor biology. So let's return to histamine for a second. And I have already shown you that the top example of histamine binding to the H1 receptor on bronchiolar smooth muscle bringing about contraction. And I could imagine that many of you listening today could fill in all the, all the missing elements on this slide as we go along. On the lower part of this slide shows an example of the H2 receptor subtype. And H2 receptor subtypes, or histamine 2 receptor subtypes, can be found on vascular smooth muscle cells, whereas histamine H1 receptor subtypes are found on bronchiolar smooth muscle cells. So here we have the same ligand binding to histamine receptors that differ in terms of their subtype and differ in terms of their location. So H1, bronchiolar smooth muscle, H2, vascular smooth muscle. Histamine binding, as we've said previously, to the H1 receptor, to the H1 uh, receptor subtype results in an increase in intracellular calcium and bronchoconstriction or, or contraction. H2 binding to a GS receptor and vascular smooth muscle cell results in an increase in cyclic AMP and bronchodilation. In the previous example, the comparator I showed you was epinephrine. So in this example, we can see the same ligand being capable of bringing about diametrically opposed responses in um, tissues that are co-located to each other. So bronchiolar smooth muscle exists in very close proximity to vascular smooth muscle. So these contrast, contrasting actions are important to normal human physiology. Here's an, another example of epinephrine. In this particular example, epinephrine is binding to two different receptor subtypes, which are found in different concentrations in different tissue. So up at the top here, we have the beta-1 receptor subtype, which is found in heavy concentration in cardiac myocytes. In the bottom example, we have the beta-2 receptor, as we've described previously, in heavy concentration in bronchiolar smooth muscle. And as we've said in the previous example, epinephrine induces uh, relaxation in bronchiolar smooth muscle if the B2 receptor subtype is activated. So both of these receptor subtypes have the same effector, cyclic AMP. In the top example, there is activation of a second messenger enzymatic signaling pathway involving phosphokinase A or PKA. This same enzymatic uh, sequence of events occurs following activation of the beta-2 receptor in bronchiolar smooth muscle. So, so far, everything's the same except for the subtype of the receptor. But this is where we begin to diverge. Activation of phosphokinase A results in activation of a calcium channel. Now, this is a divergence from what we've seen before. In contrast, activation or increase in PKA results in a decrease in another enzyme called myosin light -like chain kinase. And any of you who have studied muscle physiology, this will be a term that is not new to you. So myosin light -like chain kinase is responsible for the interaction between actin and myosin necessary for muscle contraction. So returning to the cardiac myocyte example, an increase in intracellular calcium results in an increase in troponin, which mediates an interdigitation of actin and myosin, i.e. contraction. So the net effect of epinephrine binding to the beta-1 subtype results in increase in cyclic AMP, increase in phosphokinase A, 
which activates an ion channel, calcium channel in this situation, an increase in intracellular calcium, an increase in troponin, and actinomyosin interdigitation resulting in a contraction. In the bottom example, the, decrease, the increase in phosphokinase A results in a decrease in myosin-like chain kinase and an ultimate decrease in actin and myosin re, uh, interaction resulting in less contraction or opposed relaxation. So epinephrine in two different tissue types is bringing about diametrically opposed actions even though the effector is the same and one of the second messenger signaling enzyme pathways is also the same. So complexity, it increases at every level of understanding of this particular uh, pathway. There is another element of complexity that is important. The top two panels you have seen previously, histamine binding to an H1 or an H2 receptor. The H1 receptor, through an increase in intracellular calcium, bringing about contraction, the H2 receptor, an increase in cyclic AMP, bringing about relaxation. But now we have another element to consider. So histamine binding to an H1 receptor on endothelial cells, remembering that endothelial cells can be found on bronchiolar smooth muscle and can be found on vascular smooth muscle. In this situation, histamine activating the H1 receptor causes an increase in cyclic AMP, but the ultimate uh, pharmacodynamic response is an increase in prostaglandin E2, this autocoid that I referred to previously. Prostaglandin E2 binds to a receptor on vascular smooth muscle cells to amplify the cyclic AMP response seen in response to histamine binding to the H2 receptor. Now this is incredibly important because you have the one ligand here, histamine, binding to two different receptor subtypes, H1 and H2, on three different uh, types of cells, bronchiolar smooth muscle cells, vascular smooth muscle cells, and endothelial cells. Recognizing that endothelial cells can be found on vascular smooth muscle cells and bronchiolar smooth muscle cells. And this concept of the amplification potential of prostaglandin E2 on the relaxation response in vascular smooth muscle cells in response to histamine binding to the H2 receptor is important to appreciate. Because let's, for example, consider that we come along with a drug that antagonizes the H1 or the H2 receptor. We need to have an appreciation of what is the implication of this amplification step on this entire sequence of pharm uh, that will lead to the ultimate production of a pharmacodynamic response. So the complexity ever increases. Same receptor subtypes, but different cells bringing about contrasting responses. Another example that I think is, is very important um, that, that um, people listening appreciate, and this is the concept of physiologic antagonism. And it's kind of a, a little bit of an oxymoron, but, but you'll understand by the time I'm done. I'm sure there are many of you who have experienced an allergic reaction. A common one would be in response to a bee sting or being exposed to an antigen uh, that uh, you are allergic to. What happens in that sort of uh, situation? So here represents the antigenic challenge. challenge. And let's just for this, for explanation purposes, imagine an individual who has a serious allergy to bee stings, life-threatening allergy to bee stings. So this poor person gets stung by a bee. The first initial responses to that is the body recognizes this as being an acute allergic response. And you get activation primarily of a group of cells in the body called mast cells. And I mentioned these previously because mast cells is the primary source for histamine in the allergic response reaction. So mast cells are activated. They release histamine. Histamine brings about a whole series of physiologic responses, um, including um, flushing, itching, bronchoconstriction, uh, pretty, pretty serious types of responses. 
How does histamine bring about this in terms of receptor biology? So histamine binds to the H1 receptor in bronchiolar smooth muscle, exactly as I've described before, and causes intense bronchoconstriction to the point where the patient may not be able to breathe. This physiologic response is amplified by a whole series of other chemical mediators, leukotrienes, thromboxane, I've talked about previously, and other prostaglandins, all of which can mediate through their own receptors, many if not the majority of which are also G-protein coupled receptors, and they amplify the response to cause a further increase in intracellular calcium, amplifying this bronchoconstrictive response. So you've got your patient in the emergency room. They're having a hard time breathing, and you need to reverse this. And you can do the obvious thing, like giving the patient an oxygen mass, trying to increase their oxygen delivery. But ultimately, the treatment of that patient, the reversal of their hypoxemia, or their low blood oxygen level, is to try and reverse the cause, which is the bronco constriction. And that bronchoconstriction is being mediated by histamine. So not too surprisingly, you might suggest, well, give the patient an antihistamine. And that's fine. Yes, you can give the patient an antihistamine. The problem is that the length of time that it will take for the antihistamine to actually block the impact of the endogenously synthesized histamine is going to be too long, and your patient will expire. So you need to be proactive and do something that is going to be a little bit more immediate in its effect. And here's where we use the concept of physiologic antagonism. I've shown you in previous slides where epinephrine binding to a separate receptor, the B2 adrenergic receptor on bronchiolar smooth muscle, increases cyclic AMP and causes relaxation. Well, this is a perfect and a beautiful example of therapeutic leverage. Knowing the existence of these two receptors on bronchiolar smooth muscle allows us to administer epinephrine IV in most cases and get an instantaneous response, thinking back to all those PK principles that we've talked about previously, get a plasma concentration increase rapidly as a result of IV administration, get a therapeutic concentration going whereby you activate this B2 receptor and you uh, instigate the diametrically opposed physiologic response of relaxation. So any of you who have experienced an acute allergic reaction have been in an emergency room and given epinephrine or even an EpiPen, an intramuscular injection using an EpiPen, uh, EpiPen, this is what you're talking about. A beautiful example of human pharmacology, a great example of therapeutic leverage that we are able to utilize because we appreciate this whole concept of G-protein coupled receptors and the intricacy and the level of complexity that this type of uh, principle of receptor biology entails. Then we have the whole concept of receptor subtypes and selectivity. So I've said to you before that uh, we have H1, H2, and H3 receptors. And we use histamine as an example because it helps exemplify different points. But we could use any of the other um, G protein coupled receptor mediated uh, responses as well. So H1 receptors, I've said now on several occasions, mediate the allergic response. Many of you probably experience seasonal allergies. Many of you probably in the autumn or in the springtime um, take a medication to control this seasonal allergy or, or hay fever. And what the majority of these medications target is the H1 receptor. And what they are trying to do is to reduce the impact of histamine uh, produced from mast cells. So mast cells, as we said, release histamine in response to the allergic response. Earlier um, medications that were used to treat the allergic response caused significant side effects, including drowsiness. And one of the problems was um, that uh, you would take these medications and they would improve the watery eyes, the itchy palate, the itchy palms, the sneezing, the, the tickle in the back of the throat. They would do that just fine, but they would cause a degree of drowsiness that was untenable with keeping down a job or being a student or whatever.
And part of the reason for that was that those earlier medications lacked selectivity. So these were molecules that were primarily synthesized to block just the H1 receptor subtype. But in reality, they also blocked other receptor subtypes, such as the muscarinic receptor, get, bringing about some degree of drowsiness. So this concept of selectivity is incredibly important, and it provides more therapeutic leverage. We can synthesize molecules such that they will have their primary activity on one receptor subtype. But it doesn't necessarily need to be that simple because we also have medications that we know are not that selective and they activate different receptors at different doses. A very good example of that is are the medications used to control nausea and vomiting that have their primary effect at the D2 receptor subtype, the dopamine 2 receptor subtype. But when you modulate the dose a little bit, they also have their effect, their antagonistic properties at the serotonin receptors, the 5-HT3 receptors. So we can manipulate our knowledge of receptor subtypes to our advantage, or we can take our knowledge of receptor subtypes and synthesize molecules that are highly, highly specific for just one particular type of receptor. And, and the benefit conceptually of creating a drug that ma manipulates just one subtype of a receptor with absolute specificity is that it should ideally behave in a more predictable fashion, that you should be able to anticipate toxicity and anticipate maximal efficacy in a more predictable way if the selectivity is truly absolute. So when we understand how receptors function and we synthesize drugs, we know that we can utilize these drugs to have different effects on different cells at different target concentrations. In this particular example, just to round out the total number of examples we're, I'm giving you, this is a drug, dobutamine. Dobutamine is a very interesting molecule. And to a certain extent, it behaves a little bit like epinephrine. But it is synthesized in such a way and administered in such a way so that it will purely target the beta-1 receptor in the cardiac myocyte in people who have hypotension that is uh, um, life-threatening. And what you want to do in these patients is to try and increase their vascular tone. You want to try and increase their blood pressure. So you want to induce vasocontraction. Or in some of these patients who've got a hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock, you want to increase the heart rate. You want to try and maintain cardiac function. So we can use a chemically synthesized substance which bears some degree of similarity to epinephrine, but functions by targeting the beta-1 receptor and bringing about a physiologic response. Terbutylene is a drug that actually is, is going out of fashion to a large extent extent, but has been used in the past to target the beta-2 receptor to bring about bronchoconstriction, and it was used in patients with um, asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, before we finish this section, um, I want to leave you with a final concept that is important to understanding receptor biology, and that is what modulates the response of a receptor to any given ligand? So in the PK section of this course, we understood that to eliminate the response to a drug, a drug had to undergo biotransformation uh, and elimination and our, our excretion, and that elimination was the combination of biotransformation and excretion. And ultimately, the rate at which that occurred would predicate, in part, the pharmacodynamic response that the patient would experience. And that is absolutely true. There are pharmacokinetic principles that will ultimately determine the duration of a response. But there's also a very, very important pharmacodynamic concept that will determine the uh, response to a given drug, and that is receptor activity. How does receptor activity alter 
uh, in the presence of an agonist. And there are some key points that I'd, I'd like to make here. One is that G-protein-mediated responses to drugs, as well as endogenous lycans, can change. After reaching an initial high, the response can diminish over time. This is referred to as desensitization and is achieved most commonly by phosphorylation of the receptor. Typically, it is reversible following exposure to more agonist. There is a second concept called downregulation. Downregulation is thought to be as a result of receptor heterodimerization, leading to endocytosis of the receptor. In other words, the receptor is on the surface of the cell membrane. It is exposed to the ligand. After a period of time, you could use the analogy of it just gets worn out. It just doesn't have the capacity to continue. And this process of ridding the cell surface of the receptor exists. And it does so by causing heterodimerization of the receptor, which is a signal to the cell to endocytose the receptor. Typically, when the receptor is endocytosed, it's degraded, or it can be recirculated, regenerated, and uh, returned to the cell surface. And then there's also this concept of receptor desensitization. Receptor desensitization is important because it has recently become the focus of the development of a novel group of therapeutic drugs in uh, cancer chemotherapy. So the mechanism of uh, G-protein coupled receptor desensitization is as follows. It involves phosphorylation of the serine residues, which is in the carboxy tail of the receptor in the cytoplasm. Remember, the uh, N-terminus is external, and the carboxy terminus is, is uh, internal in the cytoplasm. The uh, phosphorylation of the serine residue in the carboxy tail is brought about by a G-coupled protein receptor kinase. Um, so this gives you a, another appreciation of receptor kinases here, which are linked to the G-protein itself. And the reason why this is important is, is that there are a series of molecules that are targeted to inhibit the GRKs as a way to try and prevent receptor desensitization and thus prolong or amplify the response to a chemotherapeutic drug. Um, activation of the G-protein coupled receptor kinases results in recruitment of another protein called beta-arrestin. And we now have the evolution of a new uh, class of drugs which are targeting beta-arrestin as well. The presence of beta-arrestin attached to this carboxy tail of the G-protein coupled receptor decreases the receptor's ability to interact with the G-protein subunit. And if they can't interact in that regard, well, then the downstream second messenger signaling processes get terminated. Once activation of a G-protein doesn't occur, then the affinity for the ligand is lost and you get um, uh, sequential um, removal of the ligand from the end terminus in the extracellular domain. Once that happens, then you get a reverse of the whole process, and the GRK activity is terminated, dephosphorylation occurs, and now the receptor is good to go again, good to be activated again. That's a complex pathway, so let's just look at that in a pictorial form. So this here, let me make sure I'm on a right color here. This here is um, your seven transmembrane spanning domain. This is your NH2 terminal, and this is your carboxy terminal here in the cytoplasm. Um, upon binding of the ligand to the NH2 a terminal of the receptor, activates the receptor, and here you can see dissociation of the beta and the gamma subunit having occurred. With dissociation of the beta and the gamma subunit, you get activation of these GRKs, these kinases, which results in phosphorylation of the carboxy tail of the receptor. It is the phosphorylation of the carboxy tail of the receptor that recruits this protein, arrestin. And once arrestin um, is recruited to the protein, then you get an inability of this association between the carboxy tail and the subunit to occur.
Once this association can't occur, then the ligand loses its affinity for the um, NH terminus of the G-protein coupled receptor, and the effect is lost. Now, we can look at that in a slightly different way in, in this particular sequence. So let me change my color of my arrow. Here we have agonist binding to the receptor. The receptor is now activated. It recruits this kinase, which results in phosphorylation of the receptor. The phosphorylation of the receptor recruits a restin. Arrest and now bound to the receptor causes loss of ligand binding to the receptor. A beta arrest and binding can also result in internalization of the receptor, a little bit down, like down regulation. You get internalization of the receptor. Now, after you get internalization of the receptor, you get uh, um, uh, the possibility that the receptor is completely. Um, metabolized or degraded, or you get the potential that the uh, receptor can be recirculated through the endosome, and this recycling will result in redelivery of the receptor back to the surface of the cell. Now, this is a nice pictorial display. It looks all neat and tidy with all the ends sorted and everything makes sense. The reality is, is this is our current appreciation of the steps involved in receptor desensitization. And the reason for its importance is because this GRK represents a target for drug therapy. This beta arrestin represents a target for therapy. So what we appreciate here is in just in this one slide, we have the option of creating drugs that mimic endogenous uh, ligands, and these will be called agonists. We have the opportunity to generate drugs that antagonize the binding of the natural ligand. We have the opportunity of generating drugs that inhibit the GRK and thus optimize the ability of agonist binding. We have the opportunity of creating a series of drugs that inhibit beta arrestin and therefore prevent the alteration in the affinity of the receptor for the natural ligand. So what this slide uh, is intended to do is to represent a pictorial description of the opportunity of therapeutic leverage, of this appreciation for endogenous activity and our understanding of endogenous activity opening up our eyes to the opportunity to generate therapy targeted multiple different components within this cascade. And what I'm depicting here is quite honestly an oversimplification of the uh, current appreciation of the entire process. But it is just G protein coupled receptors. We haven't gone into this detail for all of the other types of receptors, and there is indeed a lot more information out there about the other four types of receptors, which is beyond the scope of an introductory course in, in pharmacology. So now, having uh, completed sections five, uh, six, and seven, here are the learning objectives that we started out with. And, and I honestly hope that we have achieved them. I appreciate that the level of this information is more complex than the information that has anteceded it. But hopefully, I've been able to explain it to you in such a fashion that it is understandable. So we started out with the hope that we could understand the principles of drug receptor interactions, appreciating the difference between inactivated and activated forms of the receptor. Um, that you have a, a, an appreciation of how receptors determine drug response, not only the activation of the receptor, but all this, also this concept of altering desensitization or modulation of receptor action. Be able to define the five types of receptors, and, and we talked about intracellular receptors, cytokine receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, ion channel or ligand-gated uh, channel receptors, and G-protein coupled receptors. I want you to, to be able to appreciate what they look like in a pictorial sense, the whole concept of monomers and dimerization and activation, how they work, particularly this concept of the ligand binding to the receptor,
and the sequential steps that are invoked in order to bring about the pharmacodynamic effect, both the intranuclear effects, the, the alterations in protein synthesis, et cetera, and how their function can be modulated. And, and really, our understanding of how their function can be modulated is most evolved for uh, G-protein coupled receptors. And then specific to G-coupled protein receptors, know the structure of the G-protein coupled receptor. So the seven transmembrane spanning domain, the heterotransmembrane Chimeric G protein, the um, the sequence of events that occurs following binding of the ligand to the extracellular domain of, of the G-protein coupled receptor, the dissociation of the alpha from the gamma and beta subunits resulting in the um, activation of an effector molecule, typically an enzyme or a protein, and ultimate second messenger signaling pathways involving intracellular calcium increase in cyclic AMP, and the ultimate pharmacodynamic responses, which in many of our cases was either contraction, constriction, vasodilation, et cetera. Know the three classes of, of G proteins and the effectors that they regulate. So we talked about GI, GS, and GQ, and how GI was stimulatory, the effector being adenyl cyclase, second messenger cyclic AMP. GS, the, um, uh, sorry, GI, the second one, the effector also being adenyl cyclase, but the ultimate impact being inhibition. And the third, GQ, the effector being phospholipase C with the ultimate uh, alteration in intracellular, increase in intracellular calcium and pharmacodynamic response. Appreciate how the subtypes, and we use the examples of histamine type subtypes 1, 2, and 3, adrenergic receptors beta 1 and beta 2, provide therapeutic leverage and this opportunity to uh, learn from the normal physiology uh, to create pharmacology. Understand the concept of physiologic antagonism, that's a really important one, how we can uh, use the coexistence of receptor subtypes on the same cell to bring about a therapeutic response. And then finally, as I said previously, learn how receptor activity uh, is modulated through uh, DAN regulation and desensitization. So that's a lot of material, and um, take your time to go over it and review it again as is necessary. And I look forward to seeing you in the next class, where we will move on to a discussion of dose response and uh, its calculation and importance to human pharmacology. Thanks for being with me today, um, and I hope you enjoyed class.